we're going to begin the Q&A part of the talk. If you didn't receive a piece of paper when you came in, you can raise your hand. And one of our volunteers at the margins will give you a piece of paper to write a question on. They'll give it back to me, and then I'll read it uh, as many as I can. Uh, we've already got a lot of questions, so I, I can already tell you that we won't get to all of these. Um, but that's that. Oh yeah, one more thing. Please do not raise your hand to ask a question directly. We prefer that you submit your question in a written format. It's easier for us, so thanks a lot. Uh, with that out of the way, we'll start with just some basic stuff about you. Uh, when did you first come to Korea? Uh, I arrived in Korea in 2007 and 2008. Well, I returned to the United States uh, just in time to catch the recession. Uh, after working um, at several odds and ends jobs, teaching and tutoring and substitute teaching, uh, I returned to Korea in March of 2012, and I've been here since. Okay. Have you been in Gwangju most of that time? Yes. That time? Uh, I visited Busan, Seoul, but primarily in Gwangju. Okay. Why Gwangju? Is there any particular reason? Uh, initially, there was no reason, but uh, as I uh, had been living here, I've come to realize that uh, other than the heat, and some indications that Korea is engaging in its own version of high-rise sprawl. Um, I, I like Gwangju's culture. Uh, it's not so big that I feel overwhelmed, um, and it's not so congested that I feel like I'm back in the United States, and among other things. I think uh, uh, lower population cities, people are able to maintain their character. If you get to a bigger city, things become more competitive, more congested. People don't have time to be friendly, they're tired. Uh, so it's a different type of environment. Uh, maybe bigger cities are more for maybe people fresh out of college, they have a lot of energy, they want to compete. Uh, whereas a smaller city, I think, is more open to young, middle-aged, and old. And I think you see that in Guangzhou. Okay. So you mentioned a few years ago you were back in the States. Yeah. And you saw, uh, you were back in the sort of suburban setting. Yeah. Uh, do you miss anything about the suburban lifestyle? Um, there are pockets of suburbia that uh, have actively fought sprawl and they're trying to maintain uh, a people-friendly environment. So I think if you go to the East Coast, you can find older suburbs where the houses uh, have a lot of character. They use a lot of maple, wood, a lot of oak. They have a nice paint scheme. Uh, there's a sense of community. You get nice tree-lined boulevards. Um, so there are communities where they've actively fought against the automobile intruding on every aspect of their lives and, and the spreading out and uh, negative aspects of sprawl. So, um, you know, I think there is some good still remaining in some areas, but you really have to look for it. Okay. What kind of housing do you have now in Korea? Uh, I live in low-rise housing, okay. and um, it's kind of my first experience with <coughs> Being in a dense environment, uh, I live on the third floor of a four-floor apartment. And well, I live in Songmu, so uh, you have big high-rises on each side of uh, Songmu area, and then you have a small section of uh, low-rise apartments, uh, mostly for young people. I'm I'm kind of at the edge outlier in terms of uh, age, in terms of the type of people there. I'd rather move to another area, but it's kind of my first. Um, experience in a high density environment and um, um, a good example of uh, why I want to stay there is uh, I live within walking distance of a pizza place, I live in walking distance of a laundromat, convenience stores, uh, restaurants, uh, I'm within one mile of my bank, one mile um, to get my hair cut and one mile of uh, part of my work. Uh, I do commute to work uh, in the first part of my day, but everything is really close. And the, what I have now in Guangzhou is what Ameri many Americans are striving to get in their communities now, which is called uh, pedestrian friendly or uh, more walk walkable uh, environments. Okay. Pizza friendly environments. So you mentioned the convenience of it and the mobility. What are some negatives of living in a, a highly uh, dense area? Uh, it's definitely louder. Uh, I sleep with earplugs sometimes at night, so uh, in traveling back and forth between Japan and Korea, uh, I notice uh, there's a little bit of difference in noise levels between the neighborhood that I live in and where I've traveled. Uh, but that's just, it's part of, I think, uh, the momentum Korea has right now. A lot of youthful optimism, there's a lot of hope for the future, a lot of building. Um, 
The other aspect of it is I think maybe, I don't know for sure, maybe someone can tell me otherwise, but maybe there's been a more of a negative American influence in terms of American car culture coming into Korea. When I look at Korea, I don't see a car culture. Uh, I don't know what the percentage is, but it, it, it should stay low. Uh, Koreans should stick to public transportation because uh, you don't have the space to sprawl. It would be insane to adopt the American sprawling suburb. It would be highly expensive. You would just have maybe a small group of people who could afford those houses and that land where you get one acre of land all to yourself. and. Um, I just don't envision Korea as a car culture. So there's some areas within Gwangju, maybe all over Korea, where cars are just tight against each other. There's no space for people and cars. And what they need to do is block off certain sections, like they do in downtown area, where no cars are allowed, just people. There has to be a square in every community where there's uh, cars are forbidden. And um, I think Korea needs to move in that direction. You, it's, it would be. I think ridiculous to adopt the American highway system and its view of being car dependent. I mean, if some wealthy people want to have a car, uh, I think it's okay, but to try to force everybody into a car like they do in the United States, I think that could be a trend that could be detrimental. Uh, you get more pollution, more congestion, more stress, and more uh, car-related injuries as children walk across the street or parents or whoever thinking that it's safe and you walk across and you know you get hit by a taxi or a bus or something. Okay. Uh, some people in the U.S. think that high density apartment buildings uh, breed crime. After being here in Korea, what do you think about that argument? What would you say to those people? Uh, it's very interesting because um, the dynamics that produce crime are different in every community. So. Um, you know, when I first came to the United States, all I knew about high-rise projects were that they were crime-ridden. Uh, so South Chicago is probably the most notorious for having um, these housing projects that were just so violent that uh, Vietnam veterans returning from the war used to call it a second Vietnam, uh, you know, because there was just so many guns and just all this conflict between the police uh, and there's a number of factors that contributed to that. Some people think it's race. I, I don't buy that. I think it's the legacy of slavery, uh, not properly incorporating African Americans into the American dream, and doing it the right way, uh, and uh, surrounding these projects, these uh, large buildings with highways, and these communities get trapped there. Uh, they're all concrete. They can't go to the park. They can't go to a restaurant. All the businesses move out because there's drugs, gangs, and crime. And it created what we call the cycle of poverty. So there's this cycle that just perpetuates itself. They have kids. Those kids grow up in this environment. They get into gangs and drugs. They have kids. And it just keeps repeating itself. There's no hope uh, for a lot of these kids. So high density in the United States can be done, but it has to be planned properly. Uh, drugs and guns are this kind of thing that uh, spoils the high density problem and it's what drove people to the suburbs. They call it white flight. As minority communities moved in, maybe they brought with them uh, the gangs, the guns, the drugs. Uh, white, traditionally European people started to move away from that. And you see that dynamic all over the United States. You can go into a lot of areas where the city splits into two sections, a west side, an east side, a north, a south. The, uh, with poor people in one section, and if you go into that section and you don't belong there, you could get killed. Uh, there's many stories of foreigners visiting America, um, one from Spain, one from England, uh, one recently from Australia where they just went into the wrong neighborhood uh, because they don't know. If you get lost in Guangzhou, what's the worst that could happen? As, as a man, I don't fear anything in Guangzhou. I could, <laughs> you know, drink and have fun and get lost in the city, nobody's going to bother me. Uh, maybe if you're female, it's a little bit different. I think that, that dynamic is always there. We have to watch traveling groups stay in lit areas. But for men, I, I don't fear anything in Guangzhou. If you get lost in Chicago, Los Angeles, or New York, uh, especially as a foreigner, you, you could die. <laughs> so uh, a Korean friend of mine, she visited, um, I mean, I don't want to sound too scary, but. 
you know, the, after the Australian person was shot a couple months ago, the, his father and I believe the Prime Minister of Australia just said, don't go to America. He, just, he was warning people, don't visit there. He was very upset about our culture, because it was just a senseless killing. Someone just shot him in the back. And, um, you know, that dynamic is always under the surface, and it's something that Americans, I think, need to address. A Korean friend of mine, she went to Dallas, and she was in, a, I think, a foreign exchange program. She's going to meet her American family. Well, by nature, she just went to the local bus stop. That's what she did in Korea. She went to the bus stop. But you could die at a bus stop in America. Uh, they're not crime-free. They're crime locations where people hang out to target people getting off the bus. And um, it's mostly poor neighborhoods that have those stations. And in fact, a lot of these bus stations have closed. We used to have Greyhound. A lot of people used to take public transportation and just uh, it's, look, it's looked down upon, it's just for poor people, it's crime ridden. Sometimes people use it to transfer drugs uh, by bus. So she went and someone stole her purse. Uh, she got it back, but uh, all of her money and credit cards were missing. So, and I can see exactly how that happens. They see Asian female, doesn't know where she's at, uh, very excited about being in America. Maybe she goes up to the ticket booth and she's got her purse and her luggage. And, you know, someone could just, you know, they just went by and grabbed it. So it, ha it happened really quick. And thankfully, that's all that happened to her. You can always get your credit cards and money back. But the young man from Australia, you know, his life was ended. And it was um, a very sad thing to keep happening in the United States. So. Okay. One thing a lot of the audience members might not know is that over the last few decades, crime has been decreasing a lot in the United mm -hmm. States. In fact, there's even been a lot of gentrification in major cities like Washington, D.C., where you have a lot of generally young white professionals moving back into uh, urban areas of certain cities. What, what do you think about that reverse uh, movement? Um, I, yeah, I did read one article that said, uh, it was by the Brookings Institute, that said that uh, populations of cities are starting to increase gradually, populations of suburbs have flattened. Uh, they don't know why, though. Um, I suspect it's because of the recession, but I think trends of this new reurbanization uh, of people who are basically repeating everything I've repeated, uh, spoken to you about today. Um, I mean, it'd be great if I could stand up here and say this is all my idea and I'm the first one to discover it, but really Americans started thinking about uh, the problem of the suburbs um, probably uh, by the 60s, definitely by the 80s. Uh, it's definitely, there's been this long, ongoing discussion of how to change the suburbs. Uh, and because of the recession and high oil prices, it's now reached critical mass where people are saying, let's go back into the cities. Uh, and what you'll hear, uh, the terms you'll start to hear, I think Ellen Dunham uh, has written a book called uh, Retrofitting the Suburbs. Um, other books called Urban Sustainability, uh, The New Urbanism, where cities all over the United States are hiring people to plan to bring people back into the city. And we still don't know what's going to happen yet, but uh, the worst case scenario, the American suburbs turn into a slum. Everyone just moves out and says, forget it. And all the crime that's in the cities moves into the suburbs. Um, and it becomes more like some of the patterns you see in the rest of the world where the city is for middle class, upper class people, the outer rings become slums like in India or maybe in Brazil where the outer ring is poor people, slums. Instead of suburban sprawl you have slums just spreading out from the city because everyone wants to get into the city, they want those jobs. So. Uh, what may happen over the next 25 years is you'll see a flip. The suburbs will be forgotten. All those homes will be destroyed or converted into uh, cheap apartments. And more lower class and working class people will move out to the big suburbs. Everyone who can will move in to the cities and re-urbanize. Uh, or the other alternative is retrofitting the suburbs is where they take the suburbs that are disaster and planning and they re fit it to be like a small, walkable city. Uh, and you kind of see that in uh, Guangzhou, 
uh, where you have pockets. It's not like Guangzhou is one big connected city. There's space between each of these neighborhoods. So Suwon is separated from Bongsongdong by 40 minutes, 45 minutes, I think. Uh, I don't know exactly, but they're like micro cities unto themselves. So uh, maybe that will happen to America, where the suburbs will become micro cities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, in your opinion, what do you think would be a tipping point? Specifically, what would cause a tipping point in the United States when people start to leave the suburbs in mass? Ah, that's, well, uh, the debate now is, has that tipping point happened? And was it the 2008 uh, subprime mortgage disaster? Um, now, some people still want to live in the suburbs. I mean, there are still suburbs that are good. They want to get married, have kids. Uh, but they're not having as many kids, so kids are kind of growing up alone in these big houses, just one child families. But I think the tipping point is high gas prices, uh, the subprime mortgage crisis, um, and the, the new urbanism that is trying to make cities more people friendly uh, with mixed use buildings, mixed use neighborhoods, and trying to invite young, middle class, a middle-aged and old people back into the city. Uh, that's one of the things I noticed here is American cities now are still kind of hipster oriented, uh, college kids, people with money. Um, I come to Korea, uh, I, I see young, middle, and old, uh, and I think that's very encouraging because to be human is to know uh, where you're at, uh, to know your history, to know uh, that it's just not you all alone and just living forever at a specific age. You know, when you see young people, it reminds you that you were once young. When you see old people, you see the direction you were going. In America, that's cut off, so you get individual, a radical individualism that I think is very unhealthy and very dangerous. So one of the things I like about Guangzhou is it's very balanced, very balanced, so. Okay. Uh, we were All right, this will be our last question. Uh, given your experience with the suburbs, uh, what advice would you give Korea generally now? Um, every city should have an urban planning department. Maybe they already do. Um, I think it would be important to recognize that uh, it is impossible for Korea to adopt the same uh, auto-bound culture that the United States has. There's no space for it. So you have to look at expanding your bus system, increasing sidewalk space, uh, you don't necessarily have to build more subways, but a subway can help. Uh, but there's new ways to build, you know, bus lane only paths on these big roads. So buses can just go 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, get people to where they need to go. You can build bridges over uh, the streets that allow them to do that. But I would say that um, beware of high-rise sprawl. Uh, maybe try to balance out the living environment between low-rise, mid-rise, and high-rise. Try to get a balance of things in Korea. Uh, and I think you see low-rise in Gwangju area, and you see high-rise. So maybe you need like mid-rise also, and try to make sure. And I think some of this is already here. You can go to Mudungsong, you can go to 518 Park. You have parks throughout the city so people can breathe. Um, Another thing you see in the United States is because of the more the sensitivity to pollution and climate change, they're thinking of ways to uh, make the city more environmentally friendly. So uh, as oil prices go up, maybe you want to switch to natural gas, solar, uh, hydrogen. Um, try to diversify the community as much as possible. Don't become just dedicated to the automobile because there's no room. Japan has done a pretty good job. The, the time I visited Japan, I noticed the difference between Japan and Korea is Korea is very much has a strong bus system. Um, you know, you go to the bus station, buses just go everywhere, it's affordable. Uh, same thing in Japan, you go to the train station, trains go everywhere. So maybe Korea could have a balance of bus and train, but I think with the road system out here, uh, buses would be the first most affordable choice, and then the light rail, uh, and trolleys that go down the street possibly are very good choices also. So, but I wouldn't adopt the American model, and I would avoid. I would work very hard to keep society balanced, keep drugs out, uh, maintain the strength of the family. Uh, there's a lot of key ingredients. It's kind of like uh, 
uh, making a good chemical reaction or making a good meal. Uh, you have to have multiple ingredients working together to create balance and harmony within society. Uh, America right now is very uh, unstable, um, disharmonious. Okay. Well, I have to say this is probably the most questions I've ever gotten for any talk, so your, your talk was probably very thought-provoking for everyone here. Uh, let's give him a, a round of applause and thank him for answering the questions.